and, and, and very adamantly demanding that they had some say so in what downtown was going to look and feel like, the thing that I did is we embraced it. Instead of running away from it, instead of sort of saying, well, hey, we know what we're doing. We've been doing this 20 years. Where were you last year when we planned this out? We said, you know what? You're right. These projects now need to take on a different dynamic. Although there are engineering and expert things that have to be done, the feel of the community, the input and the voices of the community need to be incorporated. So I think the big, and, and, and it was appreciated by the group because historically when that would have happened, believe me, they would have been shut out. There would have been some meeting somewhere else. We would have heard them, let them pay lip service and then done what we were gonna do anyway. Well, believe the plan changed as a direct result of their input. And when they saw that, they knew that it was a new day in City Hall, that they were now going to be welcomed and embraced. And again, I was uh, pleased I'm a part of that generation, but again, I got a little defensive. I'm the mayor now, and here are these young people who are my friends and my colleagues out there sort of with the pitchforks and the torches. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you swallow hard and you, and you learn, and you say, mea culpa, hey, we messed up, and it won't happen again. So, and, and in addition to that, we've uh, appointed them to our planning commission and to our design review committee. So they're on these commissions now, and and you, you bring them in the tent. <clears throat> Mayor Williams, you talked a little bit about your path to leadership and where your, you know, your interest was peaked and uh, in how you got to the position you're in now. And you obviously just talked about that experience with the new leaders. But I'm curious, what sort of, or what were the best experiences you felt that really prepared you for this position um, along the way? And what were the sort of things that you felt like, you know, enabled you to deal with those sort of situations? Any number of things. And, and, and you know, if anyone who has served or sought office, it's, it's a very humbling experience. Uh, you know, you people are very candid and, and let you know, you know, how they feel and, and whether they support you or don't support you and whether you're doing a good job or not doing a good job. <clears throat> but I certainly think it, I, I got a very good grounded perspective from my uh, earlier career in banking. I, I was a I started as a, as, a, as a teller, and in a teller in the bank, you are the least paid, most visible, you know, individual. You've got this drawer full of cash that you've got to balance to the penny, and even if the person, the, the millionaire developer is coming in to see the president, they don't know where. They come up to the teller and say, where's the president? And if you are having an off day or a bad day, believe me, you're going to, you're going to hear about it. So that, I think, really helped me starting off, you know, making, I don't know, five or six bucks an hour. Not that I, I believe me, I'm not wealthy now, but five or six bucks an hour as a teller and, and having that amount of responsibility. But it let me see sort of a perspective and, and, and it gave me a very valuable perspective while this was my job now that ultimately I wanted to get involved in some of those other things. That led to me doing some other things in the bank, but it always, no matter what happened, I ultimately ended up managing a bank branch, but I was probably one of the managers that they liked because I, I never forgot my experience as a teller. I think another thing that was uh, a, a very shaping of it was time that I spent here in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, just uh, down the street, uh, you know, I spent a few years at the Federal Reserve. It allowed me to see a different environment. Cleveland is, is significantly larger than Youngstown, so it allowed me to sort of look at things from a, a, a city that was more advanced and a little more sophisticated and bring some of that back to Youngstown. Uh, and then ultimately, though, I think the thing that shaped me was, was going out and walking the neighborhoods and walking the streets of Youngstown. And I grew up in a, in a, in a neighborhood in Youngstown that, you know, certainly uh, uh, needed some investment, needed some attention. So there was no place that, in the city that I feared. But even having lived there all my life, not until you walk literally almost every street and, and, and go up on people's porches and talk to them about their perceptions of the city. And you come to find out that, you know, sometimes what they wanted was fairly straightforward and simple. I mean, we all wanted jobs and we all wanted the crime to go down, but sometimes they just wanted somebody to hear what their perspectives or their concerns were. And I think that experience, I said that whether or not I won the election, I would have been a better person having gone through the campaign and gone asking people for their support, asking people about the city. So I think that largely ultimately is, is what I found most beneficial. And to this day, you know, I find my, my, my greatest comfort in just going into the neighborhoods and talking to the citizens. Again, some of them aren't always happy with, with what we've been doing or the condition of the city, but I think that, in terms of my professional uh, experiences, most shaped it is, is, is that experience of, uh, uh, it was an humbling experience, but inspiring nonetheless. And again, win, lose, or draw, I said to my wife, if, if we don't win this thing, I'm going to be a better citizen and a better professional just having gone through this, this experience. <clears throat> Uh, Mayor, we all know how uh, polarized a region can be in cities within a region. Uh, but my question is more within even the city proper. And um, 
how do you begin to uh, convince your uh, colleagues and uh, your council uh, on how to really target very limited resources, no matter whether the economy is good or bad, public dollars are always limited. And oftentimes, it's a challenge to get individuals who are thinking in a very uh, small, at a small level, to convince them that if we invest here, that will all benefit. Right. So how do you how do you how have you approach that? It's a work in progress. Um, it's, Youngstown is divided into seven wards, and and I'll be very careful because my, my council members may see this. So I don't want them to think I was in Cleveland, you know, being all wolfing at them and then going back to Youngstown. But I, I often hear, well, this is my ward. I have to invest in my ward. And, and you know, my philosophy, well, it's your ward, but it's, quote, unquote, my city. And part of our success has been the fact that when we had the Youngstown 2010 plan, we got so much involvement from the citizens to help shape some of these investment areas. And we knew that that would be of benefit later on because when it came to uh, uh, investing very scarce resources, there was always going to be the philosophy, well, you take a dollar, you divide it seven ways, and you, you sort of everybody gets a little, but it really doesn't make a difference. Or you might have to invest 50, 50 cents of that dollar over here, and that means that you know maybe you only get five cents, or, or this time you don't get any. Your, yours is the next time around. So having a plan and having already identified some of those priority areas has helped. So when we got unexpected revenue sources, grants or whatever the case was, we could say, wait a minute, folks, before we go on this spending frenzy, let's see what the plan says and let's identify. It's helped. Now, council people are still going to say, hey, well, you know, I, I appreciate the plan, but I've got my constituents I've got to keep. So it, it is not a perfect science. Uh, we still sometimes, you, it's politics, so you have to placate and you have to keep people satisfied enough. But I will give the council members credit that a number of them have started to say, you know what, I do understand the benefit of this time allowing the resources to, to be invested there. And ultimately, I'm going to persuade my constituents. And, and I say, listen, I'm willing to spend some political capital to help you do that. Mrs. Jones, this is why we invested in this neighborhood. Yours isn't bad or this one isn't better. But this is why we can leverage those dollars. And if we do that, then next time around, and, you, and then you have to make sure that the next time around, you keep those promises. So you know, some, when, when you have patient constituents, it helps. Uh, and when the constituents have been involved in the process, it helps because you can remind them, hey, we all went through this together, but yet and still, you know, politics is politics. Mayor Williams, as you plan to decommission various parts of the city, how do you intend on turning those parts of the city into assets instead of detriments? That's a great question. There's, and, and again, this is uh, theor we, it's theoretical. We haven't gotten to that point. It's sort of on paper. One of them is, is, is almost fell in our lap. We have a, uh, an individual who has a, a very unique business that requires just acres and acres of land in terms of uh, the machinery he manufactures. So he's actually been buying up houses as people have moved or people have become interested in, in moving to another part of the city or getting older or, 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 or sometimes when, when families have died or, or elder people have died and, and left a house uh, to an estate. He's actually been purchasing uh, those houses and has come to the city and, and asked us to uh, would we be willing to decommission two or three streets that are immediately adjacent to his business because it would allow him then to create a buffer because what he does is just it's very productive but it's loud and, and, and lots of activity uh, and that'll probably be our first foray into actually decommissioning uh, a series of streets and and the asset will be the fact that he's got a successful ongoing business it will allow him the opportunity to expand and, and create this buffer so after we see how that goes that will sort of be the template that we use we don't want to simply uh, decommission for the sake of decommissioning. I mean, there are areas of the city that were never fully developed that, uh, you know, if you went there, you'll find you know, people who are, or you've got our traditional downtown with the skyscrapers, and 10 minutes away, I can take you to a part of the city where people have got chickens and pigs and cows, and uh, some of which are permitted and some of which aren't, but, you know, <laughs> we don't ask too many questions out there on the east side. I'm from the east side, so they, they, they just have their own way of life out there. But some of that will be decommissioned and, and just turned into green space or wetlands. But we want to do it in a constructive way. So again, that's, that's a part of the plan that I'm often asked about, but it's still, we haven't fully implemented because you can imagine the, the, the challenges and the difficulties there. Thank you. Today at the City Club, you have been listening to Mayor Jay Williams of Youngstown. Thank you, speakers. Thank you. Mayor Williams, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this, this program is now adjourned.